Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, this is Andrew Schmidt from the 10YFP Secretariat. Uh, thank you very much for tuning into this webinar entitled Let's Meet in the Middle, How the Mid-Stages of the Food Value Chain Shape the Way We Produce and Consume. I'm just going to take 30 seconds here off the top to do a couple of housekeeping logistical aspects. Uh, we have a fantastic group of panelists lined up to speak to you today, uh, but we also do want to hear from you. Uh, however, we're going to do that through the chat box. You'll note that everyone is on mute by default. So if you have any questions or comments, please uh, feel free throughout the, um, the interventions to send them through the chat box. Um, if you're able to uh, send your messages to all of the panelists rather than sending just to the host, if you're able to choose that, uh, just so we can, everyone can see the messages coming through. Of course, depending on your setup, if you only can send it to the host, we'll make sure to go through and gather those all together. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we will also send that and all of the presentations to you after this. So I think without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Martina Fleckenstein, who is the Global Policy Manager for Food at WWF International. Martina is going to be kicking things off with a short presentation and then also helping to facilitate the discussion throughout the entire webinar. So Martina, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for the kind introduction. And I think we could go already to the next slides. I would like to welcome you to this webinar, which is, as mentioned, let's meet in the middle uh, about the mid stage of the food value chain. And um, in this, and the key message, I just would like to give a short introduction of the task force on catalyzing science-based policy action on the SCP. Uh, we will hear about examples from the One Planet Network, from the public and the private sector. Very happy to have Marianne Pjorf from the national, from the Norwegian government, and we have uh, Scarlett Elise from Carrefour and Agnes Whale from Club Med, who will present concrete examples. And we would also like to use this uh, webinar to set the stage for the upcoming food value chain consultation, which will take place for 2021. Next, please. Yes, I think that's uh, that's the intro uh, on the task force. And I would like, before I go more into detail, I would like to give a short background on uh, the approach and the work we have done. Uh, based on the United Nations Environmental Assembly decision in 2019, the One Planet Network and the International Resource uh, Panel have been asked to catalyze science-based policy actions on sustainable consumption and production, providing actionable insights on the management of the natural resource in relation to the Agenda 2030. Next, please. Uh, what we have done uh, over the last uh, 18 months is presented here in a final report, which was launched in January this year and presented at UNEA 5 uh, about catalyzing science-based policy action on sustainable consumption and production. And it is explaining the value chain approach and the application on food on construction and on textile. The focus of my short intro will be on the food sector. We will continue on this work and you will learn more about the next steps uh, during this webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, in the first step, what we have done, we have analyzed the resource inputs, the economic activities and the impacts, because for the insight on management of natural resources and raw material, it is necessary to understand natural resource in relation to economic activities and its related cycle of consumption and production. Having said this, if you look, for example, on the economic activities, it's a broad range of activities from processing, manufacturing, just to name some retail service, up to the waste uh, disposal and recycle. And this all has impacts. This has impacts on environment and it has social economic impacts. And uh, in the analysis, uh, if you talk about food or other value chains, it's important to understand these kind of inputs and the interlinkage of these three um, uh, areas. Uh, next slide, please. 
in the report or in our work over uh, the last months, we have developed uh, the value chain approach. And the value chain approach, I think that's also important to understand, is it considers the entire value chain of the economic activities by understanding what is happening in the different stages of the value chain, as well as how the value chain operates as part of the system. And the value chain approach, and I think that's also very important, is a methodology for catalyzing science-based policy action to identify key points of intervention, intervention within economic systems uh, to reduce natural resource use and environmental impacts. And the value chain approach uh, in our understanding is based on a three-step approach. The first one is to understand the value chain and identify the key hotspots. That's what we have done in the report, uh, which you have seen and which you could download, by the way, on the One Planet Network uh, webpage, followed by a consolidate existing a consolidation of existing actions and identifying opportunities and a step three to define a common agenda and priorities. And what we want to do over the next months is to have a deeper dive in step two and step three. And this should be happen in a multi-stakeholder approach, and we would like to encourage you to participate in this assessment. Next, please. Uh, besides uh, having a methodology on the value chain approach, this value chain approach has also five value added features. And which is, uh, and just to name the five, it's holistic. So the approach provides a picture of all actors, processes and drivers. It's systemic. So it helps to understand how different drivers shape operations along the value chain. It's relatable, which means it's anchored in economic activities of production and consumption. Actionable, which enables decision makers to prioritize their efforts by identifying key impact areas. And it's replicable, which means it's replicable to different sectors, products, geographics. And this is especially important if we want to scale up at the very end the activities. Next. Let me summarize um, by applying a systemic analysis, and I would like to emphasize the systemic analysis of a value chain approach. We have the possibility to identify social economic drivers and barriers. Uh, this takes into account the complex feedback loops and the value chain approach. And this is also important, goes beyond an understanding of where resource use and environment impact it can, uh, occurs. It helps us to understand why things are happening and what the key points of intervention are for science-based policy actions. Next, please. And in, uh, in the following slide, I just would like to give uh, some highlights, some of the findings we have on the food value chain. But as already mentioned, uh, we have the same also done for the textile and the construction sector. What we have done in the first step is uh, we have mapped the available data on natural resource use and environmental impacts against the stages of the food value chain as a production, processing, distribution, consuming, and managing. And what you see here is that the majority of natural resource use and environmental impacts are happening at the production side. But what is also important, and that's also one of the uh, added values of this value chain approach is that we also, uh, with this methodology, could understand the complexity of the value chain which mean that behavior at one change of the value chain can be driving impacts at another stage. So if we want to have uh, natural resource use along the whole food value chain, we still have to consider all uh, parts of, uh, of the value chain. Next, please. So what we have done is, and this is also, I think that's some thoughts on how food system drivers shape the behavior of different actors in the food system. So it's not only on the production side, it's also the food companies. And if you consider the food companies, there is still a small number of companies controlling a significant portion of the market. 
So we have the top 10 retail companies control 10% of the global market and the top 10 food processing companies control 28% of the global market. This is also driven by a public and private governance. It's driven by market dynamics and by uh, the big business and big employers. At the same time, we have the farmers and the fishers uh, which have, uh, which are suffering of fragmentation and maybe, maybe some, sometimes they have really weak positions. We have about 1 billion farmers, 84% are smallholders who are struggling with low prices, with structural uh, weakness, but also with lack of infrastructure, which was very obvious now during the COVID crisis. And finally, we have the, in, we have the individual consumers and the consumers who are also driven by, um, shaped by the offers they get from the food environment. This means very often the consumer's uh, decision is influenced by uh, the food environment, including the selection of food markets, supermarkets, products, restaurants. There is a lack of access and very often a lack of skills, which means uh, skills or confidence to prepare their own food from fresh ingredients so that they rely on processed and pre-prepared option there is a lack of awareness, so very often the consumers don't have only access limited information on the consequences of their consumption behavior, and it's strongly influenced by food companies. Having said this, and look at the next slide, um, going back to the analysis we have done that the majority of influence is happening at the primary production, and considering the fact that the influence on the choice we made and the way how it is produced is made from the middle part of the value chain, which means from the food processing, the retail, the transport, the food service, but also from the retailer. And uh, in this context, one of the conclusion we had is we need to have a deeper dive and a deeper look on the middle part of the value chain and how this middle part could be influenced for a more sustainable production uh, pathway. And next one, please. Uh, let me close um, and I have two, one more slide then. Uh, what are the challenges and opportunities we are facing? There are three main challenges what we have identified. The one is what types of food we produce and consume. Um, this has to do with sustainable diets, the shift to plant-rich diets away from ultra-processed food and meat consumption. It's about how much food we produce and consume, which is closely linked to the whole topic of food loss and waste, and it's uh, uh, linked to how we produce. So what we need is a more sustainable production, agroecology approaches, regenerative approaches, sustainable intensification. So a shift to uh, less, uh, bio, a less biodiversity harming and a production which is really reducing also greenhouse gas emissions. Next, please. And I think that's my last slide. Uh, and this links to the One Planet Network. Uh, we also have done a mapping exercise to see um, what, how uh, the ongoing programs, uh, the ongoing activities in our six programs of One Planet Network, how this um, could be mapped against uh, the value chain and what you see here. So the different colors are the different programs. For example, uh, the red one is the sustainable food system program. The green one is the consumer information. The blue one is the sustainable tourism and the orange one is the sustainable livestock and education program. And mapping the uh, existing activities again uh, along the value chain, what we have seen is that there are a lot of activities at the primary production side, there are activities at the individual consumption, but we still have the gap in the middle. And that's exactly why we want to set up this process of get more information about what's happening in the middle stage uh, of the value chain and how we could improve and influence uh, this middle part of the value chain for a more sustainable uh, production. And next, I think the next is now the next presenter. Right. <laughs> so that was my, my short introduction on uh, the analysis and the findings of uh, the report. And I really would like to um, recommend fully to have a look at the report. 
And now we will have three very concrete examples from the public and the private sector. And I'm very happy to give the floor now to Marianne Kjör. She's the senior advisor of the Norwegian Environmental Agency. She's also the national focal point for One Planet Network, and she represents Norway in the steering committee of the International Resource Panel. And Marianne will speak about an innovative and far-reaching food waste reduction agreement in Norway, involving five ministries, 12 sectoral organizations uh, from the industry. Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Martina Kleckenstein. Uh, I will talk about the Norwegian industry agreement on how to reduce food waste. Norway has reported about this agreement to the UN as part of reporting of the Sustainable Development Goals. Next, please. Here you see the report from the One Planet Network and the International Resource Panel, which is about value chain for food construction and textiles, as we just have heard about. As we also have uh, heard, we need to focus on the middle stages of the food value chain, comprising food companies, retail and food services. And we, as we also heard from Martina, we need to address what types of food we produce and consume, how much food we produce and consume, and how we produce food. We know from food waste that it has to do with climate change, biodiversity, resource efficiency, and consumption of energy and water. Besides, food waste is bad for business and household economy. Next, please. Maybe you have seen this guy before. Christopher Tidjew is a Norwegian actor and one of the characters in Game of Thrones. Together with other Norwegian celebrities, he participated in 2019 in a Norwegian TV show called The Food Shop. In the episode with Christopher, uh, the food industry told us that people prefer to eat lamb instead of meat from sheep. Hence, tons of meat from sheep are not used for food in Norway. Christopher's challenge was to fight food waste instead of dragons and bring meat from sheep back to the dinner table. In the TV show, we also saw piles of vegetables thrown away because they were crooked or did not fit into the standard packaging. The TV show was an eye-opener and created a debate about food waste in Norway. You can now buy more crooked vegetables and fruits in some stores, even at a reduced price. Next, please. In 2017, the Norwegian government and the food industry signed an agreement to reduce food waste in Norway by 50% by 2030. 12 food or industry organizations and five ministries signed the agreement. Among the ministries were the Ministry of Climate and Environment and the Ministry of Agriculture and Food. The agreement involves all stakeholders covering the entire value chain from primary product producers to consumers. This includes, for instance, food manufacturers, restaurants, supermarket chains, convenience stores, kiosks, and gas stations, representing the 12 organizations. The target also includes households. The agreement has two sub-targets. By 2020, we shall reduce food waste by 15%. And by 2025, we shall reduce food waste by 30% using 2015 as the point of departure. Later this year, we will know whether we have succeeded in reducing food waste by 15% by 2020. The signals so far indicate that we probably are on track. Next, please. So this is an agreement to halve food waste across the value chain in Norway 
within 2030. The target is in line with sustainable development goal number 12.3. It is in fact a bit more ambitious because the 50% goal applies to the entire food value chain from primary production to consumers. Also, the term food waste in the agreement includes only the edible parts of food produced for humans. This is what we either throw away or take out of the food chain for purposes other than human con consumption. From the time when animals are slaughtered and plants are harvested. This means that food resources intended for human use, but used for animal feed, is considered waste. The reduction will be measured in kilos per person per year. Measures taken at one point along the value chain may affect another point of the value chain. Therefore, waste must not be moved from one part of the food chain to another. In order to achieve the reduction targets, food waste must be reduced throughout the whole food chain. Next, please. One purpose of the industry agreement is to provide knowledge and promote cooperation. The parties must seek to prevent and reduce food waste by utilizing resources and raw materials more efficient throughout the entire food chain. This will reduce environmental consequences from food production and consumption in Norway. The agreement shall provide knowledge of the extent and causes of food waste. Exchange of experience between actors will lead to cooperation across the food chain. Better knowledge among consumers and within the food industry will also contribute to preserve food better and then reduce food waste. One example on a delivery from the agreement is to facilitate food donations. Another example is to encourage both private and public sector enterprises to report on how they reduce food waste. The parties representing the food sector are the responsible to map and measure the food waste. Next, please. These photos shows one person's food waste in one year in Norway. One out of eight shopping bags go to waste. The photo is taken by the organization Matvet, which means food wise. Matvet is a partnership between five main food industry organizations in Norway. They represent the interests of the food industry, the retail, wholesale, and the food service sectors with restaurants, hotels, and so on. MathVet provides information and advice to both consumers and businesses with the aim to prevent food waste. They also have recipes at their websites on how to use leftovers in new ways. MathVet is funded by the industry organizations, but receives also some funding from some ministries. MathVet is one of the Nordic best practices mentioned in a report on consumer information at One Planet Network's website. Next, please. When we look at food waste from households in Norway, the largest amounts of the edible food waste measured by weight are bread, fruits, vegetables, and leftovers from meals. This means that when we go shopping, we should plan our meals better. This is good both for our health and for the environment, and we can even save money. But as we have seen, the consumers is just one part of the value chain. We hope the Norwegian industry agreement can serve as a model for other countries as well, because it covers the entire value chain 
not only consumers and retail levels. Partners will meet at a regular basis to take stock and exchange lessons learned. We will trigger friendly competition and cooperation between actors, and we will have systematic mapping of food waste. Next, please. The EU is also committed to sustainable food value chains. The EU's farm to fork strategy is a key part of EU's Green Deal. This will also have an impact on our region food sector and the work to reduce food waste in Norway. We need to pay attention to food waste in the whole food value chain because we will then achieve less pressure on biodiversity, less greenhouse gas emissions, better use of resources, and a lot of other benefits. It's really a multiple win-win opportunity. And the best thing of all, it's actually quite a love hanging fruit. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne, uh, for this uh, very, very encouraging presentation and the case from Norway, which I just to emphasize, I think what is the strength is that it's cross ministries. It's with the private sector and it has clear targets from 2020 up to 2025 uh, 20 and 2030. And I'm really curious to hear if you meet the 15% this year and looking then for uh, the 30% in 2025. And once again, I think what is also important is the topic of knowledge changing and cooperation. Um, Two more things I would like to encourage you, and please could you mute somewhere is a background noise. Uh, I also would like to encourage you to put your questions in the chat box. I have added, by the way, uh, the links to the One Planet Network work program and the report I have uh, presented. And having said this, I would like to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker, which is from the private sector. It's uh, Scarlett Elisi. She is from Carrefour. She is the sustainable outreach lead for Carrefour. And uh, we will learn about uh, how big business could influence the middle chain of the value chain. Over to you, Scarlett. Okay. Thank you, Martina. And thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. So, of course, we know that food uh, has a major impact on the environment. And uh, most of the food related emissions uh, occur at the agricultural production phase. And of course, we know that certain industrial farming methods um, have um, harmful effects to health and biodiversity. And at the same time, we at Carrefour have seen that our customers not only wish to consume products that are healthier and produce more sustainably, they also want to eat locally. And we've also seen with the recent health crisis that uh, consumers are more um, e even more aware of the need to eat better and to consume locally. So if you go to the next slide, please. So this is why in uh, 2018, uh, Carrefour launched its um, transformation plan. Um, so uh, it was um, rebuilding our business model, uh, putting sustainability and customers at the core of our business. Uh, and the aim is to create value for our stakeholders um, at all steps of the supply chain and to create a positive impact on society. And in 2019, uh, we adopted a raison d'être or um, a purpose, and um, you, which you have on your screen here. And so our mission is to lead on the food transition for all. So uh, what this is, entails is providing food that is healthy, sustainable, uh, and accessible for everybody. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so to achieve this, we set transparent goals with our stakeholders and we take action at each step of the supply chain. And the most strategic of our objectives are integrated into the CSR and food transition index, which is an index that we created to track our progress on the food transition. So, uh, and this is of course audited um, and we use this to motivate our teams and to go further. 
So you can see here that we have a score of 115 percent. May seem strange as a, a score, but uh, it means that we are on track to um, achieving our objectives. So if you please go to the next slide. Um, so here uh, you can uh, here you can see we have um, uh, four key areas where uh, we focus our activities. So products, stores, clients, uh, and employees. So um, I'll just tell you a bit um, about uh, some actions that uh, we take. That um, so first we take actions um, in our day to day operations. Um, we focus on promoting. Um, and developing sustainable agriculture, um, Carrefour, uh, through its own brand products, um, has adopted environmentally friendly practices um, through what we call agroecology. So uh, it's methods that are good for the environment. And we also have our organic product line, Carrefour Bio. Um, in addition to that, to support French agriculture, we engage in multi-year contracts um, with farmers to ensure fair terms through long long term pricing and volume commitments. And these contracts help to guarantee the quality of our products and our ability to meet the needs of our customers. Um, so we also take action in store and I think Carrefour we have an advantage um, because we are in direct contact with millions of customers each day. And we really feel that we have an obligation, a duty to, to raise awareness on uh, sustainability issues and to help our, our consumers to eat better and consume um, products that are better for the environment and to help consumers participate in the food transition through their purchasing choices. So um, this is the objective of our Act for Food program, uh, which is very visible in our stores. And this is a translation of our mission in store uh, encouraging consumers to eat healthier and to uh, more sustainably. So it's really to nudge them into in, into this direction. And uh, in our stores, we offer our consumer solutions to use less packaging, to reduce food waste, um, choose better quality products at the at, um, at a at an affordable price. If you go to the next slide, please. So I want to zoom in here on packaging because uh, for consumers, it was it's really the the number one issue uh, for them. It was highlighted as the number one irritant when they go into car for stores is to see over packaging. So you can see here uh, some of the commitments that we've taken on uh, packaging. Uh, we, of course, ha um, have committed to we want to. Um, uh, we want 100% of our Carrefour brand products to be reusable, recyclable, etc. Um, by 2025. And so we've taken a number of actions in store. For example, uh, in our organic product line on um, fruits and vegetables, um, they are 70% uh, of the products are plastic free. So this has enabled us to exempt to remove um, 450 tons of plastic in 2020, which is uh, quite quite large and um, this is part of our ongoing effort. And also um, you can see in the slide, we have launched a project called Loop and it's an innovative packaging and reuse model. Um, so it's in partnership with our national brands. So you can see, you can see there's Coke, you, uh, you can see Tropicana. So the, the idea is that a consumer can, can buy a product um, and it comes in a reusable packaging, which is then um, which they then return and it's then cleaned and then reused again. So it's really the concept of a loop. If you go to the next slide, you can see the model. So, um, so with loop, we're very much in a pilot phase. We're testing uh, and we're seeing uh, how it works with consumers. And um, uh, so far it's, it's um, going quite well, but I, I think in order for this, for a project to be, the norm we um we have to we have to go larger go to a bigger scale um so th this is an, an example of the kind of innovations that we're launching uh if you go to the next slide please uh, i'd also like to share with you that um we're, we also innovate with our national brand suppliers because when you go to a car store store the majority of products are from our national brands so we've created uh, what we call the Food Transition Pact, which, which is a network of our national brand suppliers. And um, the goal here is to 
work with our national brand suppliers on the food transition and to help to build better projects and solutions to help our consumers to eat better and eat and consume healthier, healthier and more sustainable uh, products. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So another area that's very key for Carrefour is our environmental um, footprint. So we're, we're taking actions uh, in store um, to, to uh, reduce our footprint. Um, we've committed to reducing our gas or our CO2 emissions by 30% by 2030 and 55% by 2040, which has been approved um, by the science-based um, target initiative. So our actions include improving energy efficiency in store, using biomethane delivery vehicles, and working with our suppliers to facilitate reductions in their emissions. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, we recognize the need that uh, we we recognize that we need to work collectively to achieve our goals. We we believe that as a retailer, you know, uh, we have our role to play alongside civil society governments. Um, if you take the ooh, uh, if you take the issue of deforestation uh, at Carrefour, we did a mapping of where we most contribute to deforestation, and it was found that it's through a uh, procurement of our uh, sensitive raw materials, so um, you know, beef, uh, soy, palm oil, cocoa. And um, so, of course, we've been focusing on our individual supply chains and through certification and other and other methods. But certification, we believe, is part of the solution to deforestation, but it's not the answer. And um, we know that focusing on our individual supply chains is not enough. So we decided to join forces um, uh, through the CGF Forest Positive Coalition of Action, uh, where we are actually co-sponsor. And um, the, the idea here is um, we're working with other consumer goods co um, industry uh, companies, so other retailers and other manufacturers, including our competitors. And uh, we, we're, we came together and we're working to change industry norms. Um, so linked to commodities such as so soy, palm oil, beef, and pulp and paper. And we feel that if we are enough to have this to um, to push for um, deforestation free and forest positive solutions that we can change the market. Um, and um, in addition to that, in France, we built a retailer and manufacturer led coalition. Um, so it's called through the manifest, um, the soy manifesto. And through this, we committed to ensuring that imported soy linked to deforestation does not find its way into our supply chain. So we're working to implement strict specifications across our own brand of products, um, encouraging other stakeholders to share the same ambition, not just, for example, in what they sell us, but what they have across their supply chain. And so we and we firmly believe that we need other actors. We we need other actors to play to play their part. We need governments to support these efforts by providing stronger regulation on imported products, for example, that contribute to deforestation. So another issue where we believe we need collective action to to really get the move, the needle moving and to really help us achieve our ambition is the issue of plastics. Um, Carrefour helped to launch the French National Pact on Plastics with other local actors in France to set up um, to set up new plastic reduction standards for the national market. So the pact set out a common vision that was shared among the private sector, the French government, and civil society to phase out problematic uh, materials that are non-recyclable and really moving towards a circular economy. So uh, these are powerful examples on how we we need the industry to come together to uh, to achieve our ambition and the need for us to work together and even with our competitors to achieve to achieve our ambition because in the end we're all working towards um, the same goals. So we have to ensure that our respective actions are feeding into this bigger vision and. Um, when we think about our actions, we need to create transformational change and uh, to really address the, 
the challenges that are facing our um, food systems. So, so thank you, and uh, I'll leave the floor to our next speaker. Yeah, thank you. Cut. I think once again, uh, very encouraging. We will not change our food system without the private sector. I think that's uh, we need the governments, but we need the private sector. And maybe just one remark on my side is that the whole topic on food system transformation is in the focus of the upcoming UN Food System Summit. And there will be a strong linkage also what we do in the One Planet Network on transformation of supply chain uh, with the UN Food System Summit. And within the UN Food System Summit, one of the solutions uh, which have been generated is on improvement of the supply chain. Um, having said this, I and having emphasized the importance of the private sector, I want to hand over to Agnes Whale. She is the director of sustainability and philanthropy of Club Med, and she will present us interesting and innovative projects that her organization is undertaking in partnership with an NGO in four different countries in Senegal, Brazil, Indonesia. Oh, it's five. Morocco, China, and Mauritius. Oh, it's more than <laughs> I got. So over to you, um, um, Agnes, and uh, presenting your approach from Club Med. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Martina, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, good evening, uh, everybody, and thank you uh, to, to Andrew and the you know, uh, NYFP team for inviting me to present this uh, initiative. Thank you also for all those very inspiring presentation we had first. Uh, well, I have been proposed to present uh, this uh, partnership uh, that we initiated 12 years ago now. Uh, I think because it illustrates uh, how tourism industry can modify a value chain uh, even if it's in a humble way and still at a small scale, uh, but in order to share more value locally and uh, also to create new bridges between different players who sometimes uh, work side by side but don't really connect uh, or sometimes uh, live far away one from another. Uh, so the idea is the following one. Um, Historically, Clomed has always been trying to buy its uh, fresh products uh, locally when it was possible, and when it was not possible, uh, he went further to find them. But when it's not possible to find the products, it doesn't mean that they are not cultivated there. It means that the producers are not in capacity to produce in quantity, quality, regularity, uh, to meet the standards of um, a big uh, resort or be a big hotel. Um, it, sometimes the producers have uh, the soil, the know-how, the climate is appropriate and everything, but uh, also they don't have uh, the, uh, the billing and the administrative accounting uh, capacities to, to address this kind of relationship, of, of commercial relationship. So, for example, in Senegal, 10, 12 years ago, we we used to buy uh, quite a few products locally, but uh, for example, onions, onions, uh, you had a lot of onions cultivated there and sold uh, on the side of the roads, uh, but uh, we had to buy them because of uh, what I said uh, in Dakar, and Dakar uh, is a huge uh, hub uh, marketplace for Western Africa, where we, you can find onions coming from Holland, very local, so we could have onions from Holland, whereas you had these cultivated just around here. So we, we said, well, it's what can we do? And at that time, it was a chance. We, we met uh, this NGO, French NGO, uh, created in 1992, uh, which purpose was to uh, assist uh, uh, small farmers uh, in Pardon countries to, to assist them to escape poverty and precarity and just self-subsistence uh, by accessing to the market. So they accompanied them uh, in two directions. So the first one is uh, uh, how to get better um, yield from their lands through agroecological practices uh, and better, uh, be better use of their lands. 
And the second is uh, more on the management of a small business. And so they, they help them to become small entrepreneurs to access the market and uh, to train them about what is the cost, what is the price, uh, and sometimes to group together to, to, to be more efficient. So those both capacities make them very powerful to really change uh, the, uh, the, 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 the actions and the way these people uh, live. Uh, so we decided to, to try something. Normally, AgriSuite started from the offer, the producers, and they, they tell them, well, uh, how can we access, can you access to the market? And with us, it was different. We were the market, we were the demand, and we had to look around us, around our resort, if we could find some producers willing to uh, change their habits and, and try this experience. So maybe next slide uh, to see how, how does it work in a precise uh, project. They are, this is a global pattern of a project. Uh, first, there is a diagnosis just to see if we can uh, meet uh, uh, some uh, producers who uh, are ready both in know-how but also in posture in will to change and then uh, when uh, sometimes those diagnoses conclude negatively we had quite a few like this during those years but uh, most of the time we had the uh, positive intuitions and we could go for it and then uh, implementation so it means during several months or years sometimes trainings in the both fields we save so you have practices in agroecology such as culture rotations, so use of uh, organic fertilizers, or mulching, et cetera, et cetera. And the same uh, list of um, quite a few trainings in, uh, in, uh, and also accompaniment on the spot in management of a very small business. And then there is a third uh, role that uh, AgriSud uh, had and actually learned with our project is this kind of mediation of relationship, putting together uh, those producers and uh, our purchasers or our food and beverage people team uh, in our resort to, to plan um, the, the production, to, to set the prices, the fair prices for everybody, uh, and uh, to accompany and to create the confidence between the two parties who were not uh, used to work together on a long-term basis. And so it worked progressively, slower, more slowly than what we expected in the beginning, but it worked. And uh, in the end, you have a product, uh, fresh product on the buffet, fresh, local, but also organic, uh, healthy, and the rich of sense. Uh, and uh, you have a fair revenues and also planify much more safety, security for uh, the economical uh, future of uh, those uh, producers. Um, and downstream of this uh, graph, you have what, how can we give more value, uh, even more value to those products? It's uh, the condition is to say it to the clients uh, so that they can value the story of the products. And we work with our teams in a, uh, to, to highlight this. For example, the producers come in the resort and present uh, their production. Uh, we have excursions in the gardens. Uh, it happens in Morocco, in, uh, in Senegal, in Brazil, in Indonesia too, in China now. Uh, and clients, tourists are very, very happy to, to really see that. And it's not often that, uh, you know, the, the consumer can really meet the producer. Uh, this is a point, I think, in the report you showed us, uh, it's a point two and point seven of the value chain, consumption and produce production in the in food and um, it happens for example in France you can meet the producer inside of France but it's not often that southern uh, producer can meet a uh, northern consumer uh, and it creates real impact in awareness of the clients and the customers and I think and we hope it will change even when they come back home it's a little change of mind very humble one but it, it, it can really work and also we, we involve them even further uh, by fundraising in order to even uh, uh, empower more those producers and uh, reinforce the projects. For example, we finance through uh, the, uh, the fundraising to the clients. We financed uh, solar uh, water pumps in Senegal or wells in Morocco. 
uh, and uh, so the chain is much more complete in this uh, in this respect. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, we'll see that this is implemented now in uh, six countries and uh, eight uh, resorts. Uh, we also had uh, experiences in uh, Tunisia, but we had to stop because of the uh, uh, Arab Spring. Uh, you know, the, the, this is a sometimes the project programs are subject to what happens in tourism and for example in a, in senegal this year we had to not to open our resort so it was a very uh we were very concerned about the women working to produce for the resort and we decided to have them continue to produce and we had the, our corporate foundation who decided to buy production uh, in order to distribute it to baskets to very, very vulnerable or fragile families affected by the crisis. Uh, so it, it was more a philanthropic buckle, I would say, but continuing to uh, to have them work and this uh, virtuous circle to, to, to run. And after the crisis, I guess this link will continue. So we see that um, the circumstances can lead us to up a new Fields, new relationships that will uh, continue, and this is uh, what tourism, as a as a sector which is at the crossroads of many others, can uh, can help too. So maybe next step, please, just to have a, a very quick look on the kind of impact. It's difficult to measure precisely all the impacts, but let's say they are in two directions: environmental ones. Uh, so through agroecology, you have a direct impacts on the water, soils, biodiversity, climate. You also shorten the transportation uh, impacts uh, because of the, the, it's local. Uh, so, but we don't measure it very scientifically properly because it's, it, it's not proportionate to what we, we, we can do, but we know the positive uh, effect qualitatively. And we also know that it really modifies the way the local uh, technical uh, services for agriculture, for example, consider these new practices and after uh, help us to, to spread it uh, in, in the different countries. So this is uh, the impact on environmental and of course so social and economic impacts on beneficiaries who see their revenues uh, are much more secured in the future. And for example, the women in Senegal could send their, their children to school uh, the men in um, in uh, in Morocco started planting, which they had stopped for years and years. They, they were not planting anymore, and they they are confident in the future uh, again. Uh, so you you have really changes in the way they consider uh, their, their future and much more confidence. Um, just to maybe next uh, ne next slide. In the next two slides, we just see the evolution of the. Uh, of the program in, uh, in long term, uh, so in, in 10 years, you, we see that the number of farmers has been growing. Sometimes it's uh, depending on the new projects we open or not, and it's uh, sometimes stop and go. It's not uh, always uh, so easy to start a new one or to continue. And we we have, but if you look at the next one, the quantities of products, it's um, rising more sharply because we also work on the intensity of uh, uh, of uh, each project, how we can increase the quantities both uh, of the deliveries each uh, in each of the the different programs. So uh, it's still of small scale, and we would definitely love to uh, scale up fast, uh, but with other players. And as uh, Scarlett said, I think it's really collective action. So we 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 now want to invite other players of tourism or uh, locally to join those programs or to imitate them in other ways. But uh, I think the, the model works and can be definitely replicated uh, rather easily. And just to conclude, I'll try to stay in, uh, in the timing. Um, I, I think um, this is an example of, uh, well, the report showed how uh, atomization and fragmentation of uh, the, the value chain uh, can be um, uh, something that uh, uh, is kind of an obstacle to to working on it, and this helps to break down these kind of silos between the people. Uh, for example, how to group together producers 
we the women in Senegal used to work uh, each in their garden. Now they work together in four big gardens. Uh, they group together to buy or to sell to to improve their practices, uh, and we create link uh, through this between the producers and the consumers, as I said. But the, the, the chain is also enlarged since we can involve new players, the local administration, as I said, NGO that distribute to um, the, the vulnerable families, for example, this year. Uh, and also I want to insist that these programs are not exclusively dedicated to uh, supplying our resource because it would create some dependence which is not resilient. And uh, we could see during this great crisis that uh, the, the, there was a real resilience in this program because the producers could turn to other markets, local markets, direct sales uh, with a lot of agility and we were very uh, satisfied with this. And uh, I think also there is a less direct uh, impact through influence on the consumption, as I said, uh, on clients because well, they are in very special uh, dispositions in vacation, in uh, dream locations, and uh, they, they, they see that they can eat differently and uh, it makes sense and maybe they come back with a, a new paradigm in their, in their minds. Uh, and it, uh, it has also impacts on, uh, on the employees and the employees' proudness and they are great promoters of uh, such an initiative. So here I am. Maybe the next slide, just to show you the pride of uh, those women and uh, our pride of their pride. Thank you very much. Thanks, 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 Agnes, uh, for your presentation. And once again, very encouraging. And I, I really want to emphasize the importance of the sustainable of the tourism sector. If we talk about the value chain and. Maybe to point out two things, I think one thing is, and I've seen you running this project now over 10 years, so what we need is really to have long-term projects, yeah? And yeah. the other thing is uh, we really need this um, collaboration of actions, which means at one hand the collaboration on the ground, so that, like you mentioned, the people, uh, the women who have their cooperative now, but also working with other actors in the sector to really scale up um, this uh, these uh, projects and I see there is already a comment on excellent job uh, colleagues from AgriSuit. So mm -hmm. yes, I could only agree on this. This is a great approach which needs to be scaled up and I think especially women plays a very, very important role and you mentioned the kitchen garden, uh, helping women also to generate uh, uh, income to invest in building or in, in uh, education of their um, uh, children. Um, we are now in this session of having the possibility to answer some of the questions. I have seen some questions here. Maybe I start with, uh, with Agnes on the last one. There is one question. Uh, Roberto is asking how the response from the consumers is in the cases you represent. This means from the clients. Maybe, um, Agnes, you could elaborate a little bit. Uh, no, that's a question to Scarlett. Sorry. Um, Sorry for mixing them up. It's a question yeah. to, to Scarlett to a little bit talk about. There are three questions to Scarlett. Uh, one was uh, the question on the reaction and the response from the consumers. The second one was on the tools you are using to analyze the sustainability standard. And the third question was yeah. if this car for initiative is limited to uh, facilities local in, located in France, or you are doing the similar things in other parts uh, of Europe and other countries. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'm just having a look at the questions in the chat. Uh, da, 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 sorry, I'm just going down. So, um, so there was a question about the, uh, um, about the response from consumers. I, I'm not sure exactly which case that, um, it's referring to, um, we, uh, is this, if it's referring to the, the plastics. 
So maybe the one, unfortunately, we don't have a possibility yeah. to open uh, the panel this, to, for speakers. So the one who had uh, set up this question on the response from consumers, maybe you could concretize. In the meantime, maybe you could answer the question on the tools you are using to analyze and enforce sustainability standards in your supply chain. Okay, so um, so what so we mainly oh, so it's through our suppliers. We we follow international um, uh, su sustainability standards, and what we do is we have a very strict specifications um, that are, that are in our contract, and um, so that our suppliers are obliged to follow. And all of our suppliers are um, subject to uh, external audits. And, and that's how we ensure that they uh, are following our sustainability standards. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. The second question was if this initiative is limited only to facilities located in France, mm -hmm. or if you also uh, are running this in other parts, in Europe or maybe in other parts of the world. Certainly. So uh, what I shared with you was the was the vision from the group. And within Carrefour, we have um, nine integrated uh, countries. So in Europe and Latin America, so in Brazil and Argentina and in Taiwan. And um, so we, within each um, with each country of operation, there is a CSR team. So the the vision uh, uh, does go uh, go down to the countries of operation. So um, so, yes, uh, this is a vision from the group. Martina, you have your micro. Uh, I saw. Sorry, the the traditional. You are muted. Yes. Uh, se thanks for asking, answering the questions, Khaled. And I mentioned that if there are more questions, please uh, add in the chat box. I've seen that two questions to Marianne, which are on the food waste. The one is how to measure the reduction of food waste. So, which methodology do you use? And then there is a specific one on uh, the food post harvest losses. So, how to prevent post harvest losses at the production stage? Thank you, Martina. Um, I would just like to refer to my colleague, uh, another Marianne, it's Marianne Reime from Norway. She's responsible for the work on food waste in Norway at the national level. So maybe she could answer some of the questions uh, we got now. So please, uh, Marianne Reime, if you could please do that. Thank you from one Marianne to another. <laughs> um, how to measure food waste? I think that is um, that's a question posed by many uh, now these days, and um, it is something we work to figure out in the context of the national industry agreement, and uh, also, as many of you probably know, the European Commission has put uh, the topic on the agenda, and. Um, in 2019, they adopted a delegated act establishing a common methodology to measure food waste in the EU, and all member states will need to use this methodology from 2020. And um, the definition and the scope uh, is very clear, and then there will be a flexibility in the choice of uh, method, and uh, also uh, within the context of uh, the SDG 12.3, uh, the food waste index, the countries will be asked to report on food waste using the same set of um, methodologies uh, you can choose from us in the EU. So, so we have uh, in the industry agreement, we also have some flexibility of method. And uh, as uh, Mariana explained to you, we have several uh, sectors involved and 12 industry organizations, and they are taking the responsibilities for a big part of the measurement uh, in the different sectors. And uh, they apply different approaches. Some do direct measurements and uh, some are using a more of a mass balance approach to identify the food waste amounts, and some are uh, establishing reports now on a yearly basis. So it will be better and better, and more and more data. Um, so uh, we will have um, 
had the opportunity to compare from from one year to the next. And uh, uh, yeah, also an interesting question uh, to this is not only how to measure, but why <laughs> why we do measure, and um, the answer can be quite different. Sometimes you you just uh, measure because you you need to know the amount for some uh, some reason, and sometimes you measure because you really uh, you want to use the knowledge to understand what to do to develop specific reduction actions. Then you need to know much more also why food is wasted and how it is wasted uh, in order to know how to reduce it. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. And if you have any link you want to share maybe on this European uh, methodology, that would be also great. Just put it in the chat box. And once again, Marianne, maybe mute yourself because there's a background noise. I think it's coming. Yeah, super. Thank you. Um, there is uh, one more question, which is on um, on Agnes from Club Met, and uh, the question is from my colleague Asu from WWF Turkey, and she's asking if there is an intermediary, uh, intermediary merchant for buying products from the local buyers, and if not, how do you handle the logistics? So is this going direct to the uh, resource or how is this organized? That would be really interesting okay. to get more information. Yes, uh, well, the answer is it depends. Um, when Agesud uh, arrived for the, the diagnosis and the way they, they work is to really take into account uh, the context, who who is in place, how people work, and to embark uh, as many players of the chain as possible. So when you already have intermediaries who are interested in uh, having their producers, uh, their partners, producers uh, evolve, we really work with the existing chain and then we use uh, the intermediary already existing. Uh, but I would say, I think it's most of the time, even if it's uh, balanced, um we we have the we have direct relation with producers and uh, the the answer is that uh the group together in cooperatives or other different type of administrative structure with the help of agresud and this is one of the uh, of their outputs and uh, they also um uh, uh are empowered and uh uh, reinforced in the way of uh, addressing this this side of uh, the business. So, for example, the the women, uh, the organization, they organized together to to uh, uh, do the deliveries in link with our resort in Morocco. The same, and they sometimes have to invest in uh, in trucks and things like that. So you have both sides depending on uh, the existing situation and. This is an important answer, really, to not to come with a precise model, but to adapt to, to who is there and wants to do what. Thank you. Um, I think that's uh, very, very interesting. Uh, there is a long question from Chennai, and I think I just want to summarize. I think the question is especially on uh, sustainable cities and how uh, sustainable cities could be developed. I, I'm not sure um, if anybody of the panelists uh, want to step in here. What I would like to flag out that there is the Glasgow Declaration on um, on food and um, uh, which is uh, on on food policies to call an a sub national governments. And this Glasgow Declaration is also signed by a lot of mayors of big cities, and I will add the link in. So have a look on this. There are some really great ideas in the Glasgow Declaration, and I would hand over uh, to my panelists who wants to answer this question on um, how we could get to sustainable cities. And there's uh, another a lot of another uh, and rural uh, regions uh, to be developed more. Marianne, would you like to answer? Um, yes, I could uh, try. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, I work with the uh, international cooperation in the Norwegian Environment Agency. And uh, uh, as also Martina mentioned, I'm in the international resource panel. 
and they have made uh, two reports that might be relevant for this question. And one is about the uh, land use and food, and the other is about city development. So if you visit, visit the International Resource Panel's website, you can find those uh, reports. And I also see that you refer to Central Asia, and I also work with the Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia Corporation. So I know that on the OECD's websites, you will find also reports uh, if you search up Green Action Task Force, that deals with these questions. So that uh, might be a preliminary answer from my side. And I can also uh, add some of the links in the chat. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marianne. And I think we're getting to the end of this webinar. Um, thanks for everybody. You will receive the PowerPoint presentation. We also have recorded this webinar. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to read out to us. And maybe we, I think we have the final slide. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's once again, um, just a short summary. What we want to show um, in this um, webinar was to help you to set the stage for a better understanding of the food value chain, the middle part, but also the rest of the value chain. And we would also I would like to emphasize the upcoming uh, food value chain consultation. I added also a link on that um, in uh, the chat box. There will be a first series of consultation with focus on innovative business and policy solutions, which will take uh, a part in April and, and May, I think, in a series of workshops. And what we are asking at this stage is also, we want to learn more about the existing initiatives, about solutions, uh, which we could really analyze and fit in so that we get off at the very end in a development of a common agenda of actions for the food sector. And I want to emphasize once again, this is not a standalone activity. This is also linked to the UN Food System Summit's outcomes where we are discussing the same topics. And um, having said this, I want to thank you all for your participation. I want to thank uh, the panelists. Uh, I want to thank to all the presenters. I want to thank to Andrew and to Julia who have helped to set up this organization and happy to discuss, continue to continue the discussion with all of you. Enjoy your uh, your day, your afternoon, your evening, and hope to see you in one of the next webinars. Thank you.